Uh, and thanks to Kavita and Deepa for giving me uh, the opportunity to uh, talk about some of my work. Um, it's going to be more ecological and genetic than population genetic, but I hope that it will uh, bring in some elements of population genetic that will get you started on thinking about the specific problem that I'm going to talk about. Um, this is Rodin's famous sculpture, The Thinker, and some people wonder what he's thinking. I like to fancy him thinking about big questions in biology. For example, we know that there are approximately 1.8 uh, million known species, and the estimate of uh, the actual number of species, total number of species, is anywhere between 5 to uh, 10 million species. And these things range from very simple organisms like viruses to highly, highly complex organisms like uh, siphonophores and insects and mammals and lots and lots of beetles. Uh, so insects seem to have just gone crazy in terms of both speciation as well as morphological evolution. And usually when we think about biological diversity, we uh, think about species. But you can actually think about biodiversity at various levels. You can start from uh, gene, uh, genes and genomes. Genes and genomes to phenotypes all the way to biological communities. So as I said, most people think about this when they think of bi biological diversity. But now there's a lot of work being uh, happening here related to the higher level processes that you can find out. Uh, so there are various ways of thinking about this. This is how I would like to uh, think about biodiversity usually. And then, of course, we have several types of selection pressures that are shaping this organization. And then you have many ecological uh, factors which influence how se uh, selection actually acts. S when I started, like many other biologists I know, uh, I started at this level, and we know tremendous amount in, at, at these levels in uh, organisms like birds or mammals or butterflies. And we know, again, tremendous amount in uh, organisms like Drosophila, C. elegans, many bacteria where we know the genomes, genes, gene interactions very well. But there are very few groups, very few systems where you can actually span the entire uh, breadth of this organization going all the way from communities to genomes and genes. And when I became interested in biology, I always wanted to integrate things, even if I started from one end. So when I look around, there are not too many uh, groups which are trying to do that. And maybe there is a limitation. There are not too many systems which can scale from genes to uh, communities. But I'm going to talk about one particular system that I study today, which I believe can uh, scale at uh, these levels. And that is called Betsian mimicry. And the idea is that you have some very nasty organisms uh, on Earth. You have this beetle, which is very toxic. It feeds on plants and uh, becomes toxic uh, itself from the toxins it takes up from the plants. You have wasps, which stings snakes, venomous snakes that bite. You have ants, which can be very vicious. And so these things are protected from predators once predators learn to avoid them. And then you have these species, which are not themselves defended but they look like these organisms. They mimic these organisms. So this is called Betsian mimicry after the person who um, described this in the 1860s. And this is a very common occurrence. You um, will see if you just go out, for example, on this campus, you will see dozens of species which engage either in aposematism or mimicry. Aposematism is when certain organisms become toxic and they advertise their toxicity through some very prominent uh, uh, either coloration or it can be chemical, it can be acoustic signal that tells the predators to avoid these things. It's a classic example of adaptation by na uh, natural selection. A lot has been uh, written and done about it. And the reason it's so attractive, and I'll tell you how attractive this is. So butterfly people love this. Theoreticians love this. Geneticists love this. And the reason is that you know certain things very well about the system. A, you know um, what is the selective peak, what is the adaptive peak in this system. In this case, this is uh, the toxic species that birds like this drongo here avoid eating once they have some experience with it uh, in the beginning. So there's some mutual relationship between the bird and the, uh, the predator and the prey. 
So the bird doesn't want to eat something that's going to make it sick, and the butterfly, of course, doesn't want to get eaten. So you know the selection pressure, you know the adaptive peak, you also know the specific uh, uh, morphological features that are under selection. This is one of the common mimics that you'll see around here, Denidae fly. So you know this white band, the reddish color, the black tip, all of these uh, components of the wing are under selection. And you also know that this mimic is now parasitizing the relationship between the, um, the mutualistic relationship between the uh, toxic butterfly and the predator. So it's in some sense hurting that mutualistic relationship. You also know the evolutionary history of this particular mimetic form. And this is something you often do not uh, understand in many other systems. So this is a female of the same species as this butterfly here. The male is like other species in its group. So we know that this is what the ancestral phenotype was. And there has been specific selection on uh, the changes on wing um, elements that has converted this form into this form, which mimics it. So it's quite fascinating because we know all these things. We understand these things uh, pretty well. And there's tremendous diversity in bird mimicry. As I mentioned, here on this campus, we will see dozens of mimetic species. Globally, we know at least a few hundred species. So there's tremendous phylogenetic material that you can play with if you want to use this system. And this is just a selection of butterflies only from one family. In some butterflies, you have sexually monomorphic mimicry. In others, only if the female is mimetic, the male is not. There's polymorphism where both males and females have a particular form. Uh, and there are multiple forms in the population. You have a case where the male mimics one species and the female mimics another species. So it's a sexually dimorphic mimicry. You have polymorphic mimicry where only one sex mimics. So here, this female mimics, this female looks like the male, and so on. So because you have so much morphological variation, as well as phylogenetic material uh, that you can uh, use, I think we can do a lot, especially with a system like this particular kind of mimicry. One question I became interested in a few years ago was, why is there so much diversity in Betsin mimicry? Various aspects of uh, Betsin mimicry have been studied very well. But this particular aspect, diversity in mimicry, is not something a lot of people have studied and thought about. Of course, I'm not the first one to uh, think about this. There are some major papers which have been published on this. But we still know relatively little. We, have, uh, we do not have one framework where we can hang all this uh, different type of mimicry and explain that. So the questions are uh, things like, why is there so much phenotypic variation in mimicry types? Why is there not just one type of mimicry? What type of selection favors this diversity? Is mimetic diversity structured? in ecological communities? And then what are the genetic controls of mimetic wing patterns? Do those uh, controls differ when you look at different kind of mimicry? So what I'll do now is I will uh, divide my talk in these three uh, rough sections. One is mimicry dy dynamics in ecological communities. I'll present a model. Then I'll talk about some recent molecular genetic work on one of our Indian species. And then I will talk about ongoing and future work, if I have time, in the end. So on to the ecological dynamics. As I mentioned, there is not a single framework that may explain this entire uh, diversity in mimicry types. So I'll start with introducing a, a species, which I think is complex enough that you can ask interesting questions. But it's simple enough that the variation is not too crazy that you can't do anything in a lifetime. And this butterfly is called Papliopolitus romulus. It's called common Mormon because there's a single male form in this species and three female forms in India, one more in Southeast Asia. So there's a female form which looks like the male. It's called Cyrus female form. There's a stickiest form which mimics Papliopterus locki, one uh, toxic butterfly. And the third female form of the same species which, which mimics yet another species of butterfly. So this is the complexity we are dealing with. And if you start with something like this, uh, you can, I think, answer all the questions I had raised earlier, and I'll, I'll explain how. This system has been known for uh, mimicry for at least about um, 60 years now. And this is what people have thought about this. So wherever you have this kind of female-limited mimetic polymorphism, we are, in this case, starting with uh, 
among the most complex mimicry types and we'll see how this plays out. So people have, uh, biologists have speculated that natural selection favors mimetic females because predators don't eat them, whereas sexual selection favors non-mimetic females. So males preferentially mate with the females which look like them, the ancestral female form. And this balancing selection maintains uh, both the types of female forms in the population. And this has been by far the most popular explanation for why you get sex limited mimicry in the first place and then female limited polymorphism um, as, a, as the next step. But then there are some conflicting opinions about the role and strength of sexual selection. So if males are very choosy in selecting the females, the females can't diverge from the ancestral phenotype. But you do see females diverging from ancestral phenotypes quite commonly. So the idea is that males don't care, and this is going back to Darwin's sexual selection theory, males don't care what kind of female they mate with, whereas females do care. So females are much more choosy. That constrains the male wing, uh, phenotype to the ancestral pattern, whereas females diverge. But then, as I said, this is the most popular explanation for why you have female polymorphism. So the conflict here is, are males choosy or not? When you're thinking about one phenomenon, biologists say, yes, they are. When you're thinking about another phenomenon, they say it's not, even if those phenomena are actually uh, connected. So I became interested in this specific problem quite a bit. And the third explanation, which is becoming, uh, which has become quite uh, well known in the last maybe 20 years is the two female forms have different mating frequencies. Males preferentially mate with uh, different females. And females can also have different fecundity. So non mimetic female forms may be more fecund. So even if they don't live just as long, they will lay more eggs in a shorter amount of time. And therefore, you have maintenance of that uh, form in the population. Or there may be some physiological trade-offs because of which even if the physiological trade-off of uh, uh, physiological lifespan of non mimetic female forms is longer, they get eaten more, whereas mimetic forms are protected from predation, but they have some physiological cost of being mimetic and therefore uh, they don't live just as long as the predation pressure, reduced predation pressure would suggest. So um, is there some uniform explanation that can, explain, uh, that can account for all the variation that I mentioned earlier? And because I didn't find any, uh, Deepa and I actually started thinking about how we can come up with one single framework. So all this is work is actually uh, with Deepa, and we are working on the manuscript hopefully soon. So this is our model. We know that. Uh, Selection for mimicry is highly frequency dependent, and this is how it works. You have, again, the same predator and prey, and then you have a mimic in the system. And this mimic gets some, uh, enjoys a mimetic advantage. But if there are a lot of uh, toxic butterflies like this, then the chances that a predator will first uh, capture a mimetic butterfly and actually like it are lower, right? So this mimetic advantage is frequency dependent, but there's also a cost of mimicry. And this is, again, pretty well known. Mimics make themselves more conspicuous, and they also, uh, they also make themselves easier to capture because they fly slowly like the model. So most toxic butterflies fly slowly and in a straighter um, uh, flight path compared to mimics. And this is something we have done uh, recently. We have some data to show that. So there are these two really important factors. It is negative frequency dependent. It's what? Yes, yes. In this case, it's negative, and I'll explain how it is negative in this slide. So we have frequency of mimics or relative uh, mimic frequency on the x-axis, and that frequency is number of mimics divided by total number of models and mimics, so the total community which shares that particular wing pattern. And R is also the probability of encounter of a mimic by the predator. Then you have mimetic advantage, which is fitness advantage of mimics, uh, fitness, fitness advantage to mimics relative to the non-mimetic competitors of the same species. Okay? And A and Z are constants for slope and intercept uh, here, and mimetic advantage can be from 0 to anything. It's the number of 
additional progeny produced as a result of being mimetic. And then the third parameter we have is relative mimic frequency R star, which is defined as m equals 0. When the mimetic advantage is 0, that's the equilibrium mimic frequency, which gives us two zones, one zone in which mimicry is favored and the other zone where mimicry is disfavored when mimics become too numerous. Now, this is assuming that the sexes are the same and most models that I know of had assumed that selection is acting similarly on both the sexes. But now there are several papers which suggest that that is not the case. A, we know that sexes differ in morphology and escape flights and this is some old work going back to the 1980s and 90s coming out of the lab where I did my PhD. So this is mostly uh, work on butterflies and jacamars in Costa Rica. But we decided to pursue that further and this is what we have done. We have looked at males and females and various aspects, various parameters which influence flight in these butterflies. So A, we have uh, body mass and you can see that females are heavier compared to males and this is because females carry a lot of fat and eggs. The reproductive function demands that they invest much more in the abdomen than in thorax and generally more in uh, body size. So they're heavier. But if you look at thorax to abdomen mass, males invest much more in thorax than in abdomen. And thorax is uh, mostly flight muscle in case of butterflies. So males are much better equipped to fly well and often outperform their predators. Whereas females cannot really fly just as fast as the birds. And this is again something that Martin and uh, Chai had shown that males under optimal temperature conditions can uh, often fly, fly faster than the predators. Whereas the females are just about in the range of what predators can manage. So females uh, are slightly more vulnerable because of that. And there's the third uh, very important parameter called wing loading, which is body mass divided by wing area. And wing loading determines flight speed and maneuverability in a whole lot of flying objects including airplanes and insects and birds, all of which fly in different ways. But in all of these flying objects, wing loading determines uh, flight speed and maneuverability. So what this shows is that females have greater wing loading compared to males and lower wing loading means that you can fly faster. So you can clearly see that in this particular species. What does it all mean? It means that female reproductive function and morphology constrain flight performance relative to males. So if you add that uh, parameter here, oh, there's one more thing. So females are also likely attacked more frequently and less likely to escape. And this is some experimental work we can do with better experimental work, but this is all we know right now. There's some indication that females are more vulnerable and therefore females would gain greater selective advantage from mimicry compared to males. And this is given the cost of mimicry. If there are no cost of mimicry, males and females would benefit equally by being mimetic, but that costs uh, make it non-profitable to males, at least under some uh, conditions. So you can uh, have any kind of specific mimetic advantage, but we are going to consider this case where female mimetic advantage is greater than the male mimetic advantage. And that gives us now three zones. Now we have separate um, mimetic advantages for males and females the intercept of males is lower than that of females. And as a result of which you have male uh, R star reaching zero, or rather R star being at a lower frequency in males compared to the females. So from those two zones, now we have a zone where both sex mimicry, monomorphic mimicry is favored. You have beyond this R star, another zone where females still gain mimetic advantage, so they can still be mimetic whereas males have stopped becoming mimetic beyond this particular frequency. And then after female R star, both sexes become, it becomes unprofitable for both sexes to be mimetic. So if you consider that the slopes are the same, the difference between the intercept will determine how uh, wide this particular uh, window is going to be. And depending on how large the model uh, population is the toxic butterfly or toxic species population is and how large the mimic population species is. You can have species falling on uh, uh, on this axis anywhere. So you can imagine that if the model is very common, 
then the entire mimic population can be accommodated in this. So, the entire population will become mimetic, whereas if the mimic population is substantially large or equally large, only a certain proportion of the mimetic population uh, of the mimetic species can become mimetic, the rest of the proportion will remain non mimetic after they cross these two particular thresholds. Okay? Now, this is a very simple model. I have only uh, mentioned this for one mimetic form, but you can imagine that beyond this R star, R star, males may switch to another mimicry and that will give rise to sexually dimorphic mimicry, where female mimics one species, male mimic another, mimics another species. Beyond this R star, the females may do the same. So, beyond this, you might actually get female limited mimetic polymorphism is if males stop here and remain completely non mimetic. So, um, it is simple enough, can we actually test it? When I was looking around for data, I found three studies where they had reported not only the proportion of mimics, which is what you will see in a lot of papers, but they also uh, published abundance of the models. So, I have these three data sets from um, three continents, more than 50, uh, actually exactly 57 species and this is what I found. This is again frequency of mimics and we have monomorphic mimics um, in this uh, box plot and then female limited mimics here. As you can see, the monomorphic mimics fall at lower relative frequencies and female limited mimics fall at greater relative frequencies along this uh, ecological gradient and that pattern is quite uh, significant. So, based on this, you can actually uh, try to understand where exactly those R stars are for males and females. And if you have this kind of information, you can actually plug that into the model and make the model richer. You can also incorporate several other things that I will talk about in the next slide. Uh, but it is actually remarkable that you get a very similar picture. So, beyond this, you do not have too many mimics. There are two outliers here, but beyond this, you could you can speculate that beyond 0.5, mimicry does not remain profitable uh, for either sex. So, there uh, might be your R star and you can go to the field and do this on different species, different kinds of organisms. You can do a lot with this. So, anyway, from this figure, what it seems like is that in these three mimicry rings, in these three communities on three uh, continents, which have evolved completely independent of each other, you do see that mimicry types are arranged along uh, a mimic frequency gradient and that population data can define limits of R star across mimicry rings. Now, uh, this is still at a preliminary stage in some sense. You can think of a population genetic model to make this more complex. But I will just end by saying that um, I mentioned sexual selection earlier and here you can see that female forms, uh, actually not here you can see, I can show you slides later if we have time. Um, but this is something we have uh, done with behavioral ob observations on uh, captive butterflies, uh, captive bred butterflies, that female forms have similar lifespans, the mimetic and the non-mimetic female forms. They have similar mating success and they have similar lifetime fecundity. Um, we also tried to change color pattern of these uh, butterflies and even that alteration in color pattern does not seem to affect uh, lifespans, mating success or lifetime fecundity. And it is unlikely that sexual and uh, fecundity selection or physiological constraints uh, maintain female limited mimetic polymorphism, otherwise you would not get these patterns. So, based on this, I think that um, female polymorphism in polytus is not controlled by sexual selection. And again, I will get back to this if you are interested later, but we have quite a lot of data to show that uh, sexual selection does not appear to be driving this uh, whole system. So, to conclude, I would say that a simple frequency dependence model may explain diversity in mimicry types. As I mentioned, these R stars will determine what, where you will have polymorphic mimicry or female limited mimicry and so on. These model parameters can be easily quantified in the field. They can be plugged back in and you can uh, study this in greater detail if you like. 
available data seem to support the prediction that mimicry types are organized this way, and then this model can be extended much more. And there are two parameters that I would like to point out at this moment. You can imagine that when uh, the toxic butterflies are real or toxic organisms, it, up, it will apply to anything, any organism. If the models are way more toxic, that will actually push these R stars to greater values. And the reason being, once predators experience these highly, highly toxic um, organisms, they want to avoid them at any cost. Whereas if the model is slightly toxic, then bird may take a decision uh, that when it's not very hungry, it will avoid it. When it is very hungry, it's probably better to eat a mildly toxic butterfly or mildly toxic model than not uh, eat at all. So uh, toxicity of models will be positively correlated with this. And learning and membrane predators may also have an influence. For example, if you have a forgetful predator, or if predators learn uh, slowly, then that will push these R stars to lower values, right? So you can add, keep on adding parameters, and you can see where those R stars move. And in different communities with different levels of toxicity or uh, forgetfulness of predators, you may have different R stars. Uh, but again, this simple model can account for all of that um, variation, all these parameters, with the same uh, basic, infra uh, basic structure. OK, so I would say this ecological aspect is far, um, uh, far away from being resolved. But at least now we have some framework with which we can start. And in fact, we have uh, started a massive uh, study of Himalayan mimicry rings, which have many, many more species than what uh, was reported here. Uh, here. So hopefully, we'll be able to uh, look into that much more. And we'll be able to do some experiments with predators as well to see whether other parameters than what has gone into the model right now play an important part in how uh, it plays uh, this role. I will move on to the second uh, part of this entire story, which I see as a whole, even if uh, ecological and molecular things in many people's minds are uh, somewhat distinct. And again, I'm going to go back to the same species. That's my favorite species. I grew up watching it. And there are not too many scientists who grow up watching something and then study that um, as their bread and butter. I was lucky to do that. So this is, again, a very common species. If you go out right now, I guarantee you, you will see this species. It's just common all over India and actually throughout the Indo-Australian region, Indo-Malayan region. So I've already explained the polymorphism. And this is what we know about this particular species. Papilopolitus is edible to bird predators. Uh, there have been some experiments done by uh, a Japanese team which showed that uh, these mim mimetic forms actually mimic these toxic species. And birds actually learn to avoid eating these species after initial experience. And then experienced birds also subsequently avoid Papilopolitus. Now, if you feed birds these butterflies first, they think that th that's a good butterfly. They don't get any physiological reaction. They don't vomit. Um, so they continue to eat these butterflies until they are fed on these butterflies, uh, because of which birds get a uh, very, very strong uh, physiological reaction, and they just spit these things out. If you feed the birds on these butterflies first, then they never touch these. So the reciprocal uh, experiments have been done, and we know that this is toxic, this is not and this learning experience. So we know mimicry is quite well established. Uh, mimicry as a phenomenon is quite, quite well established in this species. And this is what we know about the genetics of this. Mimicry is female limited. You can cross this butterfly whichever way you like. You can do interspecific, uh, interspecific crosses, interpopulation crosses, intersubspecies crosses. You cannot break female limitation of mimicry. You will always get only females being mimetic. Um, mimicry genes are autosomal, so males carry the alleles for mimicry, but they don't express mimicry. And that also doesn't break down even if you do interspecific crosses. And then mimicry genes are arranged as a supergene. And this is a classic idea um, discussed quite a bit by Clark and Shepard beginning 19, uh, late 50s in various species, especially in Africa and uh, Asia. 
And the idea is that you have a cluster of genes. Here you can see that in this particular uh, subspecies of common uh, Mormon, you have males without the tails, the non-mimetic female without the tail, and the mimetic female is still tailed because the model that they mimic is tailed, even in the Philippines. In uh, mainland Asia, where you have both the non-mimetic and the mimetic forms tailed, there uh, everything is tailed, uh, and Wallace had some idea about how you lose tails when you go onto islands. But again, I'll uh, get to that later if you have time. So the idea is that you have one gene for tails and another gene for maybe this white band, yet another gene perhaps for these black uh, red markings there, perhaps one more gene for these white markings here, and something that will switch from this to this white band. So you have a cluster of genes, with each of which controls one specific aspect of the wing patterns, or wing pattern element. And all these genes are somehow clustered together so that they act as one single gene functionally. And the way it works is that, for example, if you have uh, a very tightly cluster, uh, placed cluster of genes, it's very unlikely that you'll get a recombination between those genes, and therefore you won't have um, intermediates between th these two female forms. And that is important because if mimicry breaks down, predators won't really, really recognize the intermediates as um, toxic butterflies, and therefore they'll be gobbled up. So the selection for separation of recombination in this particular type of polymorphism, and uh, there's clear dominance here, as I mentioned, this form is dominant over this form. So if that um, more, uh, phenotype breaks down, the butterflies are just going to get eaten up. So the selection has somehow uh, place these genes in a tight cluster. That's one uh, explanation that Clark and Shepard um, favored quite a bit. Another um, explanation is that you may get an inversion on a chromosome, which will lock up genes, even if they're not particularly tightly clustered. But because now they're uh, locked in an inversion, there won't be a recombination between uh, sister chromatids, and therefore you will get uh, alternative alleles locked up in these inversions. So all the mutations that accumulate in, within this inversion will now be alleles of each one of these genes, which will make one phenotype. And the alternative alleles will be uh, the alternative phenotypes. Now this is 1950s to about 1970s, maybe even early 80s. At that time, we didn't know too much about supergenes or even genes very well. Um, now that we have molecularly characterized a lot of genes, and now we know how genes are controlled. You might uh, think of uh, master controllers, such as transcription factors or uh, some kind of genetic control, which may also evolve, which will control this kind of a thing. But historically, supergenes is what everybody has discussed in this particular context. So what I did was I generated pure breeding lines. One line uh, gave rise only to mimetic females, and the an another uh, line gave rise only to non-mimetic butterflies. But of course, in both lines, males are always non-mimetic. But because of breeding history, we knew that that line always gives rise to only one female form. So I crossed uh, mimetic female, homozygous mimetic female, with a homozygous non-mimetic male. And we got a bunch of uh, F1s. We ignored females. So both males and females were, of course, heterozygous. But we ignored females because there's no recombination in uh, Lepidopter and females. There's a combination only in males. So if you want to get a segregating brood, you have to cross a male uh, with a fem uh, an informative segregating brood. So that's what we did. We backcrossed the heterozygous male with the homozygous female, and we got a bunch of uh, F2s, 443 precisely, from uh, nine backcrosses. And what I did was I crossed the same male in a few cases with multiple females. So the father was the same although the mother was different. So all the variation from the female uh, was different from the variation from the male. So we had this. And of course, we had uh, a brood which was segregating one is to one in female. And we didn't really use males because they're uninformative for this kind of process. I won't give you details of the methods. If you know the methods, good. Uh, if you don't know them, just don't worry about it. I'll just mention that we used uh, a nuclear marker called rat tags, 
and we did a lot of uh, Illumina uh, resequencing. We also did some RNA seq um, um, projects, and we have we had a large uh, genomic and transcriptomic data which we use. And we are also now doing a little bit of in situ hybridization that will uh, come up in the future where we have already sequenced the genome of the species and now we are uh, continuing more on this. But most of what I'm going to talk about comes from these three things, cat tags, um, RNA seq, and then some um, antibody staining. And this is what we found out. The interval, so we, as I mentioned, we have, we use these rat tags, nuclear markers. So it's a 200 base pair sequence. We didn't know where those rat tags are and what those rat tags are. We just had the sequence. So from the mapping, what I found out was that there was this rad 36, that's the name we have given this marker, which had zero recombinants between mimicry and all the SNP variation we had in our different rat tags. So this is how you should imagine it. You have all the different chromosomes, 30 in the species, and because of recombination, the association between mimicry and uh, particular SNPs is going to break down, okay? So if you have lots and lots of recombinants, as you go further from mimicry, we are going to get this uh, breakdown between the specific SNP and the mimicry phenotype that you can see. And as you get closer and closer to your mimicry gene, you are going to start getting zero recombinants. And that is what we had. And I was incredibly lucky. I know many groups which do this on a regular basis. And usually people don't have such a good success. And I felt particularly happy about it because I'd never done molecular work before of this kind. So we were able to quickly go from mapping broods to knowing exactly where this mimicry gene is. And what we found out was that there was one more rat tag which had 19 uh, recombinants out of 381 that uh, we could sequence for that particular rat tag and 10 on the other side. So we knew we were somewhere in this area. And in Bombix Mori, that's on chromosome 25. And I show Bombix Mori chromosome because that genome is much better characterized than our papillary genome. Then we started looking within this, and the reason is that rat tag, as I said, it's just a nuclear marker. You have no idea what you're dealing with. So we started looking into this. We used the back uh, library and got a scaffold from the back library, which gave us some idea of what genes were there. And this is what we found out. Uh, this particular interval spans from uh, kinesin to this particular gene here, and we have three recombinants here, one here, three here, two here. And in this 300 kb interval, there are no recombinants, which means that mimicry and all the SNP variation within this 300 kb interval was perfectly correlated, was perfectly linked. And in that interval, we had uh, in total five genes. Out of that, actually, this particular gene, which I marked here, that just blew my mind. So when you look through this, there are lots of reverse transcripted genes which may do something in uh, uh, gene expression. And this is more recent information that these genes, earlier we thought that that was junk DNA, a lot of it introduced by viruses and so on. But now we do know that uh, they play some role in uh, gene regulation. So that may be happening, we don't know. But there are no known color patterning genes in this particular interval. So whether you look through Bombex Mori or you look through Heliconia genome or uh, Monarch genome, which have been published, there's nothing which controls wing patterning there. And even in papillio scaffold that we have from this region, there's nothing that controls wing patterning. But there's this gene, double sex, which is a transcription, and it is known uh, to play a major role in sexual differentiation cascade or sexual differentiation in insects. And that just blew my mind. So if this gene already does something, you know, it's involved in sexual differentiation, maybe it is doing something. So um, what does it do? This is very well known in Drosophila, by the way, and many other uh, insects. And there are some recent papers which show exactly how DSX makes different sexes. And this is what it does. In Drosophila, for example, in male and female, you get different uh, uh, level of melanization and abdominal segments. And there, there are several uh, genes involved in this sexual differentiation. But one of those genes is DSX. So DSX makes sex-specific transcripts. 
and it's expressed at different levels in males and females, which makes certain individuals, one sex, more heavily black banded versus the other sex not so heavily black banded. And this is just last month, this particular paper. So these are uh, uh, sack beetles and other kinds of beetles which have very long horns. Males typically tend to be larger than females, and they fight with each other with these large horns and uh, um, uh, jaws. And there again, DSX has sex-specific isoforms, and it controls the sexual differentiation of adult uh, forms based on whether it's sitting in a male body or a female body. So we started digging this, fascinated by this. We started digging deeper into uh, DSX and our resequencing data. And genome-wide uh, association studies showed that this is the 300, um, uh, 300 KB interval. And there you can see that that is the area where you have absolute correlation between mimicry and uh, SNP variation, reinforcing what we knew from other things earlier. Then we started sequencing uh, this particular gene in the two female forms, and this is something we found. Quite fascinating. DSX is a hot spot of molecular evolution, especially adaptive evolution. These are the five genes that uh, I had listed earlier, and this is DSX among those five genes in the same order. Look at fixed synonymous uh, mutations, fixed non-synonymous mutations, and total SNPs. There's nothing that is fixed in other genes in this particular interval, whether it's synonymous or non-synonymous. And you get to DSX, and every exon, almost every exon, has some major action going on here. So out of um, these 588 uh, base pairs in exon 1, there are 31 uh, fixed synonymous mutations and 21 fixed non-synonymous mutations out of 59 SNPs that we had in these about 60 butterflies of equal proportion of mimetic and non-mimetic butterflies, OK? Go on to the next one. Again, there are substantial uh, number of mutations here, here. And if, even if you look at non-coding region, there are, again, quite a few mutations. Now, they may be uh, involved in gene expression control. We don't know. But overall, DSX is, in that uh, interval, a hotspot of molecular evolution. From our RNA-seq data, we also discovered that there are three female isoforms Two female, uh, and this is these are the uh, these are produced by exon shuffling in this particular uh, uh, species. So DSX makes specific transcript, and the female DSX isoforms are expressed differentially in wing disc and body. So in this figure, you can see that uh, this is DSX female isoform one, two, and three. Black is body, and uh, white is wing. So the first two isoforms are expressed in the wings, and the third isoform is expressed in the body. And if you look at males, males have only one uh, DSX isoform, and that is expressed everywhere. Then we looked at DSX uh, expression within the females, and you have mimetic females here, non-mimetic females here. Non-mimetic females have much more expression of DSX. So the DSX isoforms are not uh, present or absent among different female forms. They're present in both the forms, but their expression is uh, not the same in the two female forms. So there seems to be some overexpression in uh, the mimetic female form, which presumably uh, makes that mimetic phenotype. And this is very, very preliminary. We have to do much more work. But preliminary antibody staining showed that these white areas which distinguish mimetic and non-mimetic female forms. Those white areas express DSX quite a bit. So that is, again, one. Uh, uh, support that DSX is controlling uh, pigmentation and pigment formation in this particular group. All right, so to conclude, double sex uh, is the mimicry gene in Papilopolitus, and it, it turns out it's not really a super gene the way it's defined in classical literature. It's actually only a single gene which makes this major switch. It does have multiple mutations in it, and we don't know exactly how these different mutations control various aspects of this mimicry. Maybe these uh, specific mutations have a role in altering specific wing pattern elements. We don't know. But that is something that we are uh, now pursuing. And then it controls mimetic polymorphism in papilio by having sex-specific uh, isoforms and also by uh, 
modulating expression of this particular gene in various uh, female forms and presumably also among sexes. And alternative splicing and spe sex specific activity seems to be, uh, seems to have been co opted in this particular species. And I like to believe because of specific ecological pressures, which has completely changed the role of, uh, not completely changed, but it has extended the role of DSX in this particular species, not only to sexually differentiate individuals, but also differentiate individuals based on the form. So through this study, we have just completely extended the known function of this very well characterized gene. As I mentioned, it's very well known in Drosophila, and remarkable thing is that throughout insect world, this gene is highly conserved. You can almost um, prepare primers based on any species, and they'll probably work in uh, any other species. They're almost so well conserved. But in this one species, between my mimics and non-mimics, we found so much uh, differentiation, so much uh, SNPs. So that is actually quite fascinating as well. So I'm out of time, so I will actually stop. If there are any questions, maybe uh, I'll take those or Uma can. So far, only one butterfly group has been able to use RNAi to look at uh, how gene expression or how genes control wing patterning. Uh, in Cambridge has done that. I don't think they've published anything on it yet. And you can also do um, uh, transgenics, transgenic lines, and you can do that. Again, there's only one lab, Antonio, uh, Antonio Montero, who is now at NUS, who has done that. So somehow butterfly people haven't jumped into these molecular tools uh, so much as um, Drosophila and even uh, beetles. So those beetles that I showed earlier, they're not a modern system, but there recently people have used RNAi. So I'm hoping to do it, but we haven't even started yet. But we know collaborators who are interested in doing it, so hopefully we'll start doing it from this summer. All right, again, thanks a lot to both of you for uh, giving us this opportunity. and. Uh, I'll be around, so if you have any questions about this.